everyone, and welcome to the webinar on responsive web design. My name is Tommy Rausch. I'm the creative director over here at the services uh, division of Infragistics. Um, today we're going to cover responsive web design, which has become very popular uh, with all of the new devices that are out in the marketplace today and all of the new form factors. It gets more and more challenging to design for every device. So hopefully today we'll take you through what responsive design is, some cool tips and, and tricks um, to help develop your, your websites and to think responsibly, whether it be an application or a website, um, and also some useful resources as well as examples. So let's go ahead and uh, kind of dive into this a little bit. So the elements of responsive design, as I mentioned, you have fluid grids, flexible media, and now the CSS3 media queries. That's the key right there is the CSS3. Uh, there have been media queries for quite some time, but CSS3 allows you to do some new and exciting things like detect the orientation of the device, uh, as well as a number of other um, a number of factors that you're going to see in a grid, uh, as I'll show you as, as, it, as we evolve through this presentation. In addition to that, once I go through those different elements of responsive design, I'm also going to show you a couple of techniques, such as showing and hiding content, there may be some examples where you might not want to show all of the all of the content on a smaller form factor. Um, a perfect example may be if you think of your typical grid, a uh, data grid that you may have on a uh, on an application. Uh, you know, to be able to show that on a small form factor such as a phone, you may not want to show every column. You may want to you may choose to filter out certain columns or have the user to determine which columns they want to see. So that showing and hiding content technique is something that, that uh, can be useful when you're implementing this. Uh, you know, part of responsive design is being able to design once and publish everywhere, and that's the, that's the ideal situation. So you have one set of code that you need to maintain. And, and that, you know, that's the ideal situation, but in some instances, as I mentioned, you may run into where you want to show and hide some content. And I'm going to show you some examples of that as well. One of the, a couple of the other things that we need to take into account is that we're also designing now for touchscreen devices. So we will uh, touch on that topic as well, uh, as well as give you a few different menu options and some of the popular patterns that are out there right now for menu options in responsive design. And last but not least, I'm going to provide you with a couple of examples, real-world examples, so you can see some of the better designs that are out there right now, as well as some tools that will help you when you're, when you're designing your own application or your website. So let's jump right into fluid grids, uh, which is the first part of our responsive design components. Now fluid grids, a fluid grid, a well-designed grid system will make your design not only more attractive to the user, but also more usable, more usable by creating a consistent user experience. So what is a fluid grid? Well, grids in general, have been around for, for quite some time. Uh, and the theory of designing with grids is not really a new theory. Uh, what it does is it, it really creates a visual rhythm that your users can easily follow. So if you think of a, think of, uh, a typical print publication, uh, those have been using grids for quite some time. And basically what it does is it allows you to align your text or your copy or your imagery, uh, whether it be to the baseline or to the left-hand side, um, of the grids and the columns and allows you to um, create a consistent rhythm. And it just seamlessly allows the user to flow through your application uh, without, without interfering with the content. Now, as I mentioned, fluid grids have been around for, for quite some time and uh, it's, not, it's something that's, that's not new. Actually, I should say grids in general. Fluid grids are uh, new to, to CSS3, but grids in general have been a, a, a principle of design since, um, since design has, has, has evolved. And Michelangelo is one of the, the primary um, founders of, of, of a principle which he called the golden ratio. So he thought that the golden ratio was a perfect grid from nature through our own human forms. And many of you have seen this drawing before. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty iconic drawing. And you can actually see here how Michelangelo started to break the body down into these different boxes and grids for symmetry as well as 
uh, as well as placement, and, you, and he started to see there was a pattern inside the human body. And as he started to study nature more and more, he started to realize that this pattern seemed to replicate itself um, across, um, across what he felt was the most, the most beautiful design out there, which was the human form and the human factor. As I mentioned before, grids have been used commonly in print design. And here are some examples uh, of grids and how you would align content to a page. So you can see it's just really a series of boxes <clears throat> that allows you to justify your copy and your, your photos um, to get a nice, consistent user flow and feel. Now, how does that apply to responsive design? So in responsive design in CSS3, we have fluid grids, grids now. And a fluid grid, there's, two, there's uh, a couple of different systems that are out there. There's many different frameworks uh, that currently exist. And I'm going to show you, this is one of the common ones that are out there, which is a 960 grid system. And a 960 grid system is basically, there's two variants of that. There is a 12 column and a 16 column grid. And you can see kind of right here how it's broken down. Um, and Sometimes these are not, you know, you don't have to exclusively use a 12 or a 16 column grid. You'll find some examples where the two are mingled together and they're spliced together to create some pretty dynamic layouts. But the grid at its, at its, at its source and the fluid grid itself allows you to uh, um, have a pattern that your designs will follow and allows you to target your CSS appropriately and, and layer, layer content according to what device and form factor you're currently on. So this is a typical 12-column grid. And you can see the 12-column grid is divided into portions that are 60 pixels wide. So if we look right here, this is 60 pixels, this is 120, three columns is 180, and so on and so forth down the line. So by breaking that 960 into these 60, 60 pixel wide columns, you have a nice even distribution and you can, if you have a photo, you can say, hey, if it's, on a, um, if it's on an iPad, I want it to be 12 columns. If it's on a phone, I want it to be only 7 columns, uh, and so on and so forth. I'll show more examples of this as we, as we continue, um, but that's, that's an example of the 12-column grid. This is a 16-column grid, and a 16-column grid basically consists of 40-pixel increments, and each column has a 10-pixel margin on the left and right, which creates a 20 pixel wide gutter between the columns. So again, we're back up to that 60 pixels again. Uh, but you can see that you can easily flow in 16 columns as well. Now, right here is an example of something called a hybrid grid. Now, the hybrid is, you see we're using the 12 column grid as well as the 16 column grid to create this, this layout. So you'll see up top, you have your 12 column grid, 12 column grid, 12 column grid in the first three rows. Then from there, we go to 16. 16s in the middle, and then we go back down to 12 again. So that's just one example of how you can splice the two together to suit your needs and fit your layout according to what you're doing. So in a true responsive web-based layout, it's likely that your grid will reflow when the screen size changes. And what you see right here is kind of a pattern, a real simplified pattern of what responsive design is. So if you see, take a look at this in a wide browser, you can see the content flows uh, and stacks, you have this, this uh, larger box at the bottom with the two underneath, and as you start to size down, the, the content starts to shift. And as you get down to the smaller form factors, you can see they start to stack on top of each other. So a lot of this is done up front, a lot of this is thinking through uh, how, my, how my grid will work, uh, how, what I want my design to do, kind of putting a priority of, of order of content, in which order should my content appear, uh, and then stacking that appropriately within your grid. So here are some real world examples now of fluid grids. So I, I decided that, let me take a crack and show you guys with graphics in there instead of just showing the boxes, uh, examples of this and how it would look. So on the right hand side you'll see uh, an example of um, a very, very simple type grid system. <laughs> I chose this one purposely because it's a very boxy design, and you can very easily see how the content flows. So in the wide, in the desktop type layout, you can see that you have your content stacked stack across the top. As you start to move down to your tablet, you start to shift your content. So you'll see that you have A and B on top, C and D flow underneath, E and F flow underneath that. 
and then once you go down to even the smaller form factor, it just stacks right on top of each other. So pretty easy, pretty simple uh, to understand right there. That's ultimately what we want to achieve when we're doing some of the responsive design. Here's one that's a little bit more complex. Um, I just wanted to show you this is not much more complex, and it's still a very boxy design as well. And you can see that you have your A, your B, and your C, and then once you shift to a tablet, the B and the C content, which is over here in this example, will shift underneath. Uh, and that's just one other way of thinking of how your content is going to flow. And then once you get to the smaller form factor, you can see that it actually reshapes the size of the grid for B and C and then flows it in appropriately. Here's one that uses a combination of some of those grids, the 12 and the 16 column grid. Uh, and this one gets a little bit more complex. But I wanted to show you that uh, it, this can basically apply to any type of design. It doesn't have to be very boxy. It can be open, can have copy, can have uh, different elements that, that can be used to, to work. So virtually any design that you're thinking of can be accomplished within one of these grids. That's basically the gist of fluid grids. And what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to flexible media. As I mentioned, there's a number of frameworks out there right now for grids. We currently, um, we like to use some of our own, um, own grid systems. You can develop your own, or you can go out there and you can uh, look at some of the popular ones that are out there. If you do, just do a quick Google search on, on fluid grids, you'll find that there are uh, a number of examples and, and new ones popping up every day that you can build upon. So the second piece which makes this, uh, which makes responsive design attractive is the flexible media component of it. So the flexible media can be imagery, it can be videos, it can be a combination of the two. Um, but the biggest challenge is, hey, how do I handle my media? So one of the major problems that needs to be solved with responsive web design is working with images. Right? So there's a number of different techniques that you can, uh, that you can use when designing responsibly. And what I'm going to do is show you three different common techniques that are, that are used. Uh, the first one is, is really um, an example where the image itself would just scale with, uh, in proportion to the layout. So we'll detect the resolution, and then what you do is instead of putting a, a pixel increment in there, you would put a percentage. So you would say, uh, I want this image to be 90% of the width of this column, and it will detect the width, and it will size it appropriately. And I'll show you examples of that as we, as we continue. One of the other ones, uh, another popular technique, is hiding and revealing portions of the image. And a third technique, which I tend to use uh, quite often, but it's a little more complex, is creating sliding composite images. Uh, and let's, let me jump into these and show you a little example of, of each one. <laughs> so this one right here is the first one we spoke about, where uh, you're basically detecting you're detecting the resolution and the width of your device and you're scaling it appropriately. In this example, you see in the green right here, what we're doing is we're just scaling it to 100%. So as long as no other width-based image styles override this rule, every image will load in its original size unless the viewing area becomes narrower than the image original width. So if, the, if you change devices or you rotate your device, uh, it'll detect the width and scale it appropriately, which is pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. The example just below that is uh, another common technique that people will use because people have said, hey, well, you know, if I want to have an image and I want to have something that appears really crisp and clear on a larger resolution device, isn't that kind of overkill to have this hefty image and this hefty weight, um, you know, load up on a smaller device? Now, in most instances when you have two or three images, it's really not going to affect your load time. However, if you're building something that, let's say, is a gallery uh, of, of you know, whatever it may be, whether it be music or, uh, you know, icons or, or imagery or whatever it may be, you may want to investigate swapping out the images. So what this does is detects your resolution, and then based upon what size resolution you're on, it will deliver the appropriate JPEG. So you see right here, if the image source, uh, right, right here, we, we serve up a small res JPEG. If the data is full source, we load up a large res, large res JPEG of the same image. So this will help uh, maximize your, your productivity and also um, decrease the, the amount of load time on some of your applications if you're running into something that has multiple images. But as I mentioned, you know, more commonly than not, I'm seeing the, the, the top 
the top option um, be implemented. Now, here's an example of exactly what we're talking about, the foreground image that scales with the layout. So what I did was I created a little example for you uh, with this little red riding hood mock-up, and you're going to see in, in the three, those three different examples we talked about and how they come into practice. So in this one right here, basically all you're doing is you're taking that same image, that exact same image, and when you're on a device, you're just having it scale. So on the right-hand side here, we're on a smartphone, let's say, and it's scaling down to whatever the width is. So it works pretty nicely, right? I can still kind of make everything out. I see a little red riding hood. I see the wolf. I get the nice shot of the photo. That's all well and good. But let's say for some reason... Um, you know, I, I did not, I really didn't want that effect. I wanted to have a, a different look and feel, and I'll show you what I mean right here. So, this is that te technique which we talked about, which is called creating sliding composite images. So, this is, this is a technique where, let's say, you know, it's very important to me where I want to have the content on the two sides be in focus at all times. But I didn't like it in the previous example because maybe it scaled it down too much and I needed you know, I needed the detail in the wolf to kind of come through. Uh, and at that small resolution, I was concerned that people weren't really going to be able to see it. So, you know, this is a really, really neat technique uh, that, that, you know, I, I've used quite often and we're using more and more because you can get some really, really good effects with this. And you can layer, um, you can layer as many images as possible to get some really neat, neat um need transitions and need visual appeal. So you'll see right here, what we do is, right, you take those two images, you take the image of the wolf and you take Little Red Riding Hood, and we actually will go ahead and float the elements on top, layer on top of each other. So we have, in this instance, we have the uh, image of the, the sunrise in the background, uh, and we have Little Red Riding Hood on the right and the wolf on the left, so they're all on separate layers. The image in the background will crop according to whatever the width or resolution is. So we basically crop in from the left and the right based upon how much of the viewable area is there. And then we float the other two elements and we detect the right and the left side of the device. So if this was an iPad it would go out or a tablet, it would, it would move out a little bit further. If it was a smartphone, it comes in as you would see here. And Basically, you would always have the wolf and little red riding would be on, on the outer edges. So you get a really cool uh, technique here that, that really impresses a lot of people when you see it. There's many different ways that this can be implemented and many different effects that you can get. Uh, so I, I definitely recommend exploring this one and trying this one out in, in any of your projects where it, where it makes sense. Here's another example where you may want to hide and reveal portions of the image. Right? So you may want to kind of say, hey, you know what, I, I want to, as we did in the previous example, determine how much of the image I wanted to show. So if we just took this image and we decided, hey, let's go ahead and just crop it on the left and the right, what would happen is we would lose our title. And that really wouldn't be a, a great achievable result. You kind of see here I put these crop marks in to show you what you would achieve if you just cropped it on the photo. But what we do here is we actually float the, the title on top of the image. So we crop the image and then with the title we're detecting the width and we're scaling it to 100% of the width of the device. So no matter what size resolution you're on, that title will scale up appropriately and it will always look clear and sharp on, on whatever device you may be on. And this is just another example to show you exactly what I just spoke about. How the image is cropped and the title scales to 100% of the width. So the third piece of flexible media is CSS3 media queries, and this is something that um, this is something that is, is kind of new and, and has really evolved responsive design. So what exactly is a CSS3 media query? A CSS3 media query allows us to change our layout to suit the exact need of different devices without changing the content. And that's ideal right there, right? The key is without changing the content. So a media query is a logical expression that is basically either true or false. So the CSS associated with the media query expression is only applied if the device expression is true. So in this example, you may want to detect if somebody is on a color device 
And if they are on a colored device, you may want to serve up the um, serve up something to them. If they're not on a colored device, you, you may want to hide it. So this is just one example. I'm going to show you an example of all the different um, all the different media queries and things that you can achieve. And here's a here's a grid of some of the media queries that are out there right now. So you can see that you know some of the things you can detect. You can detect the color, the color index, the aspect ratio, the device height and width, <laughs> the resolution of the device, um, and these are great ways that that you can, as I mentioned, use CSS3 media queries, detect what device you're on, and then serve up the appropriate style sheet so that it serves up the right, the, the proper experience. So one, uh, let me just pull out one example here. So one example that's very commonly used is orientation media query. And the orientation media query allows us to target specific styles based on the current screen or device orientation. So you have two properties, landscape and portrait which allows us to change a page layout based on the browser's current orientation. So very useful, especially with smartphones and tablets, right? If they're on, we detect, hey, it's in landscape mode, so I want to serve up, um, serve up this type of experience. You're in portrait mode, I want to serve up the completely different type of experience. So this is one of the more common ones that you definitely will use. Um, so I recommend, you know, taking a look at this and look at orientation media query and, and probably experimenting with that one first just so you get the hang of it and how responsive design is implemented and how it works. So the browser or the device determines the orientation by listening to the width and the height of the window. And if the height is larger than the width of the window, it knows that it's in portrait mode. And if the width is larger than the height, it knows it's in landscape mode. So you can see right here in this little snippet of code that I've given you that you know, you can see that what it does is it takes a look, and then if it's if it has if it detects this resolution, it will serve up the appropriate style sheet, and so on and so forth. So this is just a quick example of, of how a CSS3 media query may appear. Uh, there are different syntaxes and how it can be written, but this is generally um, how it's done. So that's the real magic behind um, responsive design. Now, a lot of people you may, a lot of you may be saying, well, you know, this is great. You know, what, what exactly, what devices support media queries and what's out there, right? Because if you're going to be developing this, you want to make sure that uh, you're developing to a common denominator and everybody can, <laughs> can really see what you're doing. So the good news is that if you look there, almost every one of the browsers that are out currently support the CSS3 media queries. Uh, unfortunately, IE is a little bit behind the eight ball, and IE 8, it does not really work, but from 9 and above, uh, it works great, and Windows has every indication that they are heavily leaning towards jQuery and responsive design, especially with their new um, with their new new devices coming to the marketplace. So, you know, and, and in some instances, people have asked me, "What do I do if I have it where I also need to design for IE8?" And there are some tricks and tips around that. You can use JavaScript to detect and listen and serve up another experience. Um, you know, obviously it's going to be a little bit more work. In many instances, I recommend people um, not even bothering with the earlier versions, but uh, sometimes when you're in a corporation and you're, you're stuck with, uh, with certain operating systems and certain uh, browsers, you may have to take the extra steps and, and necessary measures to do that. So I would still encourage you to design responsibly and figure out how to make it backwards compatible. So look to the future, but also don't neglect um, you know, if, if you can, don't neglect the, the previous browsers out there. It's very, if it's very important to you, um, I would definitely do that. But you have to start thinking responsibly, and you have to start designing this way. It will save you a tremendous amount of time and resources as you as you continue the process. So those are really the three basics of responsive design. As I mentioned to you, I was going to show you a couple of other techniques and tricks. Uh, and uh, tricks and tips that, that can help you as you're, as you're developing your process. Now, before I go into this, one of the, the questions that I, I get quite often is, you know, how do you design responsibly? You know, what's the right technique? Do you, do you design for mobile first and then design the desktop version? Do you design your desktop version first and then think mobile? And in most instances, most designers and most creative directors and, and uh, UX artists, will, will, UX designers and architects will tell you that the way to do this is to think mobile first. And the reason for that is because you are forced to 
um, only include the necessary elements in your design. Right, so it's almost human nature. If you have a bigger space, you kind of tend to fill it with more stuff. And, and the same thing holds true with design. If you have a bigger canvas and you have more area to put things, you may stick other little elements and, and different things that may not necessarily lend to the user experience and actually detract from it. So what I like to do is, and I like to actually design the two of them simultaneously. I like to have both screens up at once. I'll have the smartphone resolution up and the desktop resolution I don't work on them together at the same time. Uh, it, it, for me, it's very effective and, and something that, um, something that, if you can do it, and once you've got it down, uh, it really is a it really is a great technique because you um, it, it kind of helps evolve both designs at once. But for those of you that that and maybe that may be a little too complicated for, I would definitely definitely recommend going mobile first and then building up from there. So let's talk about showing and hiding content a little bit. So I know before I did mention in my slide, and I pulled that up right here, is uh, although media queries allow you to change our layouts to suit the exact needs of different devices without changing the content, right, and that's the core of responsive design, um, sometimes, as I just mentioned, you may have other elements that are not necessary uh, and that you want to remove when you come down to a smaller size. So here's an example of something like that. So this is a, a music festival, and, and Sasquatch has been doing a great job with this for the past couple of years, actually. They've been one of the early adopters of responsive design. And you can see what they do is uh, they hide various elements when they move down to the, to the smaller form factor. So <laughs> they have this you know, nice little animated um, squirrel flying a plane right here that's kind of neat and fun and interesting when you're on the website. But once you get down to the smaller form factor, you can see that if you just scale that down, it really wouldn't look look right. It really doesn't add too much. It pushes all the content down. So therefore, they just chose to hide this once they go to the smaller form factor. You notice also what they do is in their navigation, they'll actually hide some elements in the nav. So they just pull out whatever the key elements are. So not only can you hide graphical elements, you can hide navigation. You can hide different, different things um, based upon your layout. So this is a more advanced technique. As you um, as you develop and evolve your process, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention to let you know that this is something that could be done uh, could be done out there. Now, touch screen, right? So we all know that a lot of these devices are are, are touch screen compatible, and <laughs> with that comes a couple of challenges. So, what are the major challenges that you need to take into account when you're designing stuff responsibly when it moves down to that? Uh, to the tablet or the smartphone device. So with touch screens, there's a different set of guidelines and, uh, and things that come into place. So one of the most common ones um, is, is you know, the swapping out of the cursor for, for just using your finger to, to navigate. So you know, there's a common, common phrase out there which is uh, people refer to as fat fingers. So you, know, you, you got to kind of, there's all different people, all different sizes and shapes. Um, you know that that will be using these devices. So you got to make sure that your touch targets are wider, and that people have an easy time navigating and, and clicking through um, some of you, through your navigation. And you'll see examples of this in the next section, which is the menus. And they'll show you some examples of how people have taken complex menus and turned them into different representations of menus, so that they were more uh, easily accessible on touchscreen device. There are other things, of course, to keep in mind. Uh, one of the other big ones, which is uh, hovers. So, you know, in some instances you may have a navigation that changes color when you hover over it, or a tooltip. Um, some of these, you know, you really can't achieve because in reality there is no hover on these devices. Uh, it's really a, a click interface is, is what, how the device responds. Um, you can create a timing mechanism on there to face the hover effect if it's really important to you. So as again, there are, uh, with anything, there is a workaround. There's a way to achieve it. It just takes a little bit more time and research to get these things done. But just wanted to keep, you guys to keep in mind that when you're designing this, of course, you know, keep in mind these, these factors for the touchscreen devices. Now, here are a few different menu options. Uh, just to give you examples of some of the different menu patterns that are out there and how people will, um, will, will handle this. So in this example, what you see right here is what they've done is when they go down to the smaller form factor, they take the text-based navigation, 
and they turn it into icons. Now, you know, it's not always a one-to-one -one. in this instance. They seem to have, there's more navigation than there are icons, but as in the previous example, they may choose to filter out some navigation based upon whatever device you're on, um, and, and that's up to you. That's really for you to determine what content is most appropriate. I often recommend not really hiding that, that navigation, uh, just finding a different way to um, represent it. And I'm going to show you a couple of more other examples that I find are a little bit better and a little bit more um, easier to use and, and translate well across the devices. So here's another one, which is kind of a minimalist menu. And this example is, is really simple and straightforward, where they're really limiting, uh, and they take, think up front with the navigation, we're only going to have, in this instance, four navigation points. Uh, and, and what they'll do is they just um, kind of size it out appropriately and just increase the padding between the navigation items as we get to a wider device. This one is one that's very commonly used in the drop-down menu. So you may have an instance where you may have, you know, eight, nine, ten, twelve different menu items across the top, and it's virtually impossible for you to uh, create all of those as icons or, uh, or what have you, or, you know, Maybe it's the icon option would be feasible, but it may stack too much and it may force everything down. So basically what this does is once it determines that you're on a smaller device, it will just pull it up in a drop-down, and then from there, the device itself will take over. Uh, I know the iPhone, I think the Android does this as well, so if I were to click on that drop-down, it would serve up the drop-down list in the native, uh, native format of the phone. I'd be able to select where I wanted to go and jump to that navigation. This is one that I find to be the most useful, and this is uh, an, ex an expanding or kind of like an accordion menu. So as you start to come down in size, what will happen is you'll actually get a little icon on the right-hand side over here that indicates that there is a navigation. Once you click this, click this, it will come down, and you'll start to see all your different uh, navigation points. So this is one that I use quite often and I think is, is very useful, and, and I, you may find... Uh, find using this works out for you guys as well. So I mentioned again uh, a few examples and tools that will help set you guys on your way and start designing responsibly. So here's an example of, I'm going to give you a couple of real world examples of some sites that are out there first. So this is one called FoodSense, which is a, a great site. Um, what I like about them is this is a great way to kind of show you how they're actually shifting and completely changing where the navigation appears based upon the device. In this instance, the site is very visual. Uh, it's food, and, and you know I think it's it's something where they want to maintain the integrity of the images. They don't want to scale that down too much, so they want to try and keep this uh, that image in the middle there as big as possible. So right now, in this instance, you'll notice that the navigation is on the left. Then once they bring it down to uh, more of a tablet-based form factor, you'll see what they do is they keep the width of the photo, but they'll take the navigation and they shift it up to the top. So now you just basically took, I'll show you one more time, so you have your navigation on the left, moves up to your right. And then once we go down to the smaller form factor, what they're doing here is they're using that expanding navigation, but they're using the icon and the logo to actually target that. So in the previous example where we saw those three lines that indicated it was an expandable menu, right here what you see is uh, they'll click on the logo and it will expand the navigation from there. So I also wanted to show you a couple other examples. So that one was kind of very visually, um, kind, of, kind of visually impactful. It was kind of more simple in its content. It wasn't as text heavy. But this also works with sites that have a lot of content. So right here you may see the Boston Globe. This is a news-based website. And we'll use, you know, use tons of content. And what will happen is um, you'll see here that it works effectively to also be able to scale stuff down. I encourage you to go take a look at them, look at them on every different device, uh, and see what's out there and, and kind of see how they, how they handle these devices. But they've been doing this for quite some time as well. And what are the better examples that are out there? Here's one other, which is Starbucks, that everybody's probably very familiar with. Um, and they do, they kind of combine both the graphics as well as the, um, as well as the text. And you can see here, it's just, you know, they do a great job of reflowing the content down to the smaller form factors. Again, this is another one I encourage you to kind of take out your devices and try it on every device, and you'll see some of the neat effects and, and results that they achieve right there. Um, we're actually designing something 
in here and infrastructure right now that that will um, make use of responsive grids and charts and components. And we're looking forward to sharing that with you, uh, sharing that with you very soon in the near future. Um, now, here's one other example of, of this is this is one of the tools that I find very useful when I'm designing things responsibly. So, it used to be where you would design something and then you'd have to run around to all the, to find all these different devices and try to test them on on many different form factors and functions. But now, uh, Matt Kersley and Matt, if you're out there listening, thank you very much. Um, has designed a great website where what you can do is you can basically just plunk your URL in here and it will show you visually how it will appear on all these different devices. Uh, it's, it's great. It's an awesome tool. I encourage you to go out there and check this out. There's a couple other ones out there, but this is one that I, that I tend to use a lot um, and does the job pretty well. So, in summary, that's, that is really responsive design. Um, you know, if done appropriately, it can eliminate the need for a different set of design and code for every new gadget on the market, and thus increasing productivity and positively affecting your bottom line. So it takes a lot of time up front. Uh, it does take a little bit more planning to get this done right and do it appropriately. But, you know, what we have over here is we have a team of UX and UI and creative people that will sit down and we will, before we start a project, we'll look at it, we'll... Uh, map it out on the board. We'll kind of sketch out all the different flows. But once you've done this and once you've done this process, you will find that it, that it, it definitely pays off in the long run and can be a very re rewarding experience, not only for your, uh, for your user base, but also for your company in general. Um, that's really, that covers responsive design. I uh, hope you guys learned something today. Uh, you know, if you, if you um, have any other topics or if there's anything else that you'd like to see in future webinars or like me to cover a little bit more extensively, just feel free to reach out to us. You see my email at the bottom right there, uh, troush at infragistics.com. Feel free to email me and um, love to look forward to um, presenting another webinar to you guys. So go out there and uh, design responsibly. Thanks a lot.